Mm-hmm. Yes, don't forget to breathe. It's just like exercise. <laughs> so, in 2017, we had such an amazing year in Virginia. Do you agree, Karen? Yes, absolutely. So we had 11 women elected to the House of Delegates. It was mm. phenomenal. When I ran for office and I quit my job, threw everything on the line, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna lose it. Just literally lose it. Um, not only the race, but everything else. You know, trying to keep myself collected. But then I found out what was important, the things I was running for, like Medicaid expansion, mm -hmm. and running for my children, you know, so that they could see leadership in various forms because our community was just so divided after the election of Trump. I just felt disheartened. We had the Women's March. We had, you know, it was just such, a, it was a time where you just felt so conflicted. And the other thing I was running on was the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. I believe that women should have equal work for equal pay. And this year we're on the precipice of history. Now you being a delegate, serving in the house way before I got there. Yes. I you know, know what it's what it's like to feel marginalized, you know, mm -hmm. in a climate that just wasn't built for women. Not at all. Not and, at all. And just the Equal Rights Amendment was something that will change all that. It will be the game changer. And we're hoping that Virginia becomes the thirty eighth state. What do you think about that, Karen? I think it's exciting and uh, I am very hopeful mm -hmm. that this will come about. It's been a very long battle that uh, many people and many generations have been involved in. I actually met Alice Paul no. many years ago. She came to the, she was in the Northern Virginia area and it was wonderful because she, she spoke about writing the Equal Rights Amendment. Mm -hmm. It was changed at, after 1923, but in fact it was much longer at the time. And then she rewrote it and sim simplified it, I think is mm -hmm. probably the best word for it. But um, now I think we're, we're all set, and people are feeling it nationwide. Mm -hmm. So I, Virginia, it would be wonderful for Virginia to be the 38th. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I know what it's like being in the moment of mm -hmm. this. When you talk about things that we're doing now, we're standing on women's shoulders throughout history. I mean, when Alice was creating the 19th Amendment to ratify it, to, to give us a right to vote, I mean, you know, Lisa, you know, she was talking, she told stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen the movies, you've seen history where women were drugged from Washington, D.C. in this, in the dead of winter simply because they wanted the right to vote. Force fed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. Jailed. Right near right. here. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're standing on their shoulders. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Hopefully about to make history here it in, gives in you Virginia. Goosies, it, it, it? Oh, it, it does. It just gives you goosebumps. Absolutely. Uh, I hope we're all together, mm -hmm. you know, popping champagne corks. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. on the steps of the Capitol, celebrating mm -hmm. come this January, February. Now, yeah. we've never seen this much diversity with the Equal Rights Amendment. And maybe, Ainsley, you can jump in here. You know, when, when I decided to champion it, it was because of my history with women's rights. Mm -hmm. I've been working for campaigns as a super volunteer for mm -hmm. 10 years. And I w mine started in 20, uh, 2008. Um, where Obama was running, Hillary was running, and I was like, yes, women are going to break the glass ceiling, girl power, and then it just changed to another dynamic, which I am very pleased with, because I love Obama just mm -hmm. as much as I loved Hillary. Um, but this year you see this intersectionality coming to the forefront where we didn't feel like we had a voice at the table, right? We didn't feel like we were part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, I was also like a super volunteer with the Jennifer Wexton campaign. Mm -hmm. I started out in April with the primary and went all the way through until the very mm -hmm. last day. We were working probably 14 hour days, knocking doors in the morning, entering data, and then I, I was um, a fellow with her campaign for the all the candidates in Northern Virginia. And it really showed me like we've gone so far 
in such a short amount of time and we still have so far to go mm -hmm. and we've gone from like my personal hero Alice Paul to suddenly mm -hmm. I'm working on the same movement that she yes. was in which is just a crazy concept to me um, probably just a year ago today I wouldn't have believed it if I knew that this is where I'd be did you ever think that you know the misnomer is is that those who are numerically more mature don't understand that those who may not be equal in that numeric <laughs> status mm -hmm. I'm, I'm balancing this <laughs> that they don't know that there's not mm -hmm. equal rights like if we use the term millennials not to offend yeah. anyone but mm -hmm. they'll say millennials think we already have equal rights they mm -hmm. think we are already afforded what do you think the disconnect mm -hmm. or the, the conversation well I'm 17, so I'm significantly younger than a, lot really? of, yeah. <laughs> than a lot of my representatives. And I think there's like a disconnect between the generations of the problems that people um, like our representatives mm -hmm. age see versus the problems that I see. Because mm -hmm. it's a totally different viewpoint that we're going at mm -hmm. with this. So part of the Equal Rights Amendment would be like the age gap. Like, so it would like bridge yeah, the yeah, disconnect. Bridge the, right. dis bridge the disconnect between yeah. that. And it's and, not even just millennials, mm -hmm. because I think That's millennials I, are more informed mm -hmm. even, mm -hmm. right? Because some of the older generation, they already think we have ERA, yeah. and in fact we don't. And I think what's so exciting about this too mm -hmm. is in the wake of the Me Too movement, mm -hmm. we find, or I think, I really believe that there's a, a connection between the lack of equality and violence against women. Mm -hmm. So I think this is so such monumental for us to be mm -hmm. able to, to change the paradigm. Absolutely, you touch on a great point. And maybe you can chime in, Julia. You know, when you say we already have equal rights, people tell me all the time, I'm carrying this bill, they were like, Hala, we are, Delegate Ayala, we already have equal rights. I'm like, <laughs> technically? <laughs> right. Well, well <laughs> not really. Yeah, uh, we don't for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see it, you know, with the Me Too movement and with the fact that. Um, harassment laws mm -hmm. are not adequately enforced. Mm -hmm. We can see it in, in the wage gap, which still persists, um, mm -hmm. even in the same job category often. And, but the reasons for it, um, I think, are twofold. Uh, number one, if it was in the Constitution, every school child would learn mm -hmm. it as right. they're going through school. And it would, I think, really infuse the culture with this understanding that we should all have mm -hmm. equal legal rights. When they grow up to be judges and are on juries, mm -hmm. This would, I think, really transform our culture. Uh, but also, uh, to get technical for a minute, in the law there is a difference. So if we have the Equal Rights Amendment, most legal scholars believe that women would, uh, um, sex discrimination, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would receive a closer um, degree of judicial scrutiny. Mm -hmm. So if there's discrimination based on race or religion or national origin, right now those um, types of discriminatory laws receive very careful examination by courts. Mm -hmm. And if the Equal Rights Amendment is passed, then sex discrimination um, by the government would similarly mm -hmm. receive this more careful level of review, which in turn would elevate uh, the number of times in which, for example, the laws are enforced. So yep. it would have a lot of beneficial effects. So break this down to me as if I'm a fifth grader, <laughs> because we have to translate that mm -hmm. into daily terms, and maybe you can chime in too. Um, you know, when somebody says, well, what about the Lily Ledbetter Act? Mm -hmm. What about the Voting Rights Act? What about the 14th, 15th, 16th, 20th Amendment? I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It, think of it as a contract. It's not prohibited. Discrimination might be covered with the 14th Amendment. You might be able, in certain cases, but not in sexual assault cases and others. And so legal protections for women or to really men and boys and girls, mm -hmm. all of the people are affected by the results of the Equal Rights Amendment going into the Constitution. And I think we'll study this more and see this show up more in our history books. Mm -hmm. I remember when I read about suffragists, yes. right? It was mm -hmm. a few pages at best, mm -hmm. right? Along with Amelia Earhart, right? It wasn't, there wasn't this dedicated chapter. And so I think we can help promulgate that by having the Equal Rights Amendment. And without it being in the Constitution, there is no legal teeth. We need the, that's the bedrock, mm -hmm. the fundamental document of American society. And if we can, if we can see that, right, in the Constitution mm -hmm. in plain English, um, I think that will afford us um, a different way of thinking about ourselves as women. 
most people pay attention when you say it's constitutional law. Right. And they and even they might change their behavior as a result of it because that is the constitution has teeth in it. And somebody's going to follow through if you're going to violate the constitution. And so the thought of possibly doing that might allow people to withdraw from an action that would be very hurtful anyway. Very hard to change yeah. laws yes, it is. If, mm -hmm. if, there, if it's an amendment to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. You can't just repeal it right. or change your mind and mm -hmm. roll it back, right? So. Well, you know, we've seen some very interesting yes, things in this have. climate, yeah. so I agree with you. Yes. However, we've <laughs> seen some anomalies. So when, let's talk about the law itself and you know, what happens when we ratify it? Where, what, what happens? If Virginia becomes that 38th state, um, what's going to happen? You know, we talk about this all the time. Um, Delegate Carol Poy is the champion mm -hmm. of this bill. She'll be the first African-American woman to champion this in the House of Delegates. Mm -hmm. And me being Goosebumps the first... again. Yeah. <laughs> and me, co-patron, chief co-patron, the first Latina to do this. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a big discussion because when we talk about our history books, and the Constitution, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily encapsulate diversity, right? Or women, right? We're, we're, we're right. here, and what do you think that projection is like? When when I talk, I know I talk from a personal experience, right? Mm -hmm. How do you view it? I like to say that you're gonna you want people to represent the population, mm -hmm. so uh, rather than exclude people from it. And the, excluding women uh, under the ERA from the U.S. Constitution really keeps them from getting the e true equal rights. I mean, it says it right there in the title. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very important step to make. And to say that we need to bring Republicans and Democrats and independents together on this. And I think the poll from the Christopher Newport, mm -hmm. um, the Wason Center, is a, a critical component to this because we're... 81% of the people in Virginia 81%. support this, and it's the most enthusiastic to support of, of any issue that they ask them about. More than the tax cut. Yes, <laughs> yes more than the tax cut. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and, and I think that's a very important point to make so that when you sponsor the bill or when you have the bill before the legislature, you want to have as many people co patroning it as possible from both sides of the mm -hmm. aisle. Um, because one of the difficulties I had in the General Assembly was getting the other side to be a co-patron. Those who were inclined to do it, were, were, we didn't want them to stick their necks out necessarily unless somebody else was with them. And um, it, because they really did bear the brunt of it on many, many issues. And so the legislature will have a Republican and Democrat yeah. this year. And that's, that's terrific. That's exactly. And then get more and more and more. Uh, as co patrons So I think to your point, education, you know, mm -hmm. you've done some amazing grassroots work, mm -hmm. you know, with VA, Gratify, ERA, right. with, uh, you know, um, please help me with the, the name, Wofa. Um, oh, We of Action. We, Thank we you. of Action. Yes, ma'am. And then Thank National you. Organization for mm -hmm. Women. And so many coalesced and said, look, we're going to move this forward in a bipartisan way because equality isn't yes. a partisan issue, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But we still have to combat the, 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 consciousness and dialogue about why I'm still it's bizarre to me in 2018 that we're still talking about discrimination against gender or race mm -hmm. or who we love or our religion right. etc cetera, etc cetera. but when we come back to the ERA uh, it's it's baffling to me because it's almost as the our fellow GOP members do not know our history like they supported the ERA. You know, yes. I think they introduced the it. <laughs> and I, I think a lot of the a lot of the lawmakers now say that they do want equal rights for women. I think that some of the fears that we hear um, actually are not things that the ERA would affect. Uh, a lot of them have actually already become commonplace in mm -hmm. America. They've already mm -hmm. become the law without the ERA in place. So what the ERA really would impact is women's lives and men's lives too. A great deal of the case law has been um, helping men to ensure that as caregivers, yeah. as military spouses, right. they receive um, their due as well. And it is inclusive in so many ways. So um, both both sexes, you know, when you have the genders covered, I think it's good that we have inclusivity of um, mm -hmm. lawmakers as representing the, all of the people um, in Virginia. Absolutely. Uh, you know, all races. Um, I think it should not be leaving anyone out. Mm -hmm. We we don't want to leave anyone behind. You know, it affects the family's bottom line too, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yes. Right? 
men and women. If you're when mm -hmm. you're married, right, you, uh, your husband should want his mm -hmm. wife to be as successful and be able to make the same amount of money as he does because it it, it impacts the the household the bottom line. Right? Yes. absolutely, it's, it's an economic, economic if argument. If we're making a dollar for a dollar, you know, compared to our white male counterparts, that's right. This is this is really enriching the lives of our family and yes. our community and you know, our retirement, mm -hmm. and right. you know, the, everybody right. wins. And w I have had a conversation with just, and maybe Ainsley, you can jump mm -hmm. in here, where we talk to individuals about the Equal Rights Amendment on a spectrum of age, race, religion, and they think it's a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. they, they say, if you do this, you won't get this, right? Or mm -hmm. if we, we get this, you won't get this. Mm -hmm. and, or it's some dog whistle they add to this. What do you think about those conversations? like? How do you f interact with those? I live in a more conservative part of Northern Virginia. Okay. So a lot of times I'm having interactions with my peers where they go after me and insult the ideas that I support purely because I have different uh, political views from them. So mm -hmm. the biggest problem that like we're seeing isn't that they don't per se support the Equal Rights Amendment, it's they don't understand it. That's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's well said. Mm -hmm. well said. And also, uh, there I was reading a story about Ellie Peterson who was a co-chair of, she was the Republican co-chair of ERA America with the Democrat Liz Carpenter. And um, she was in constant conflict with Phyllis Schlafly. Oh. Interestingly, Ellie is from Illinois originally and so is Phyllis Schlafly and so am I. And, um, and there was always, I always had this embarrassment because I kept thinking this is, mm -hmm. you know, that, that point of view that really puts forth um, misstatements and threats and yeah. fear yeah. about this is going to, uh, mo mothers will kill their children and um, yeah. they'll have unisex bathrooms. We fake news was and new. Yes, <laughs> yeah, right, it is exactly. It started with four and, uh, Yes, and, but what Ellie said was, sometimes in political parties you find people who are not be able, cannot be elected to the party or a government mm -hmm. position, so they have to have a platform and they have to have an issue, so they come forward with one that's completely different because they're going to get the attention. Yeah. And she, you know, she was pretty tough in her criticism of Phyllis Laffley, but she also kept working with her bipartisan um, person, Liz Carpenter, in order to put forth the issues that were very much truthful and uh, needed to be said and explained to people. Mm -hmm. And they got a lot of support. The main problem at that time, and that was. Uh, in the late 70s was that many people had uh, promised to bring forth money to, for the campaign and they decided they got a little cold feet and they didn't have the money to put forth the program that they had planned. So that was a tough, tough thing I think. But when you think back to all this crazy statements that have been said uh, and fear has been the fear number monitoring. one and That's you know right. we even have some of that today not necessarily yeah. with the ARA mm -hmm. but it works with people. Well, They'll use it as an excuse. The Shafley, uh, the Family Foundation in mm -hmm, Virginia mm -hmm. is, is steadily at work. We have mm -hmm. former Our delegate daughters. Bob Marshall who mm -hmm. is carrying on the spirit of Shafley throughout the General Assembly mm -hmm. and, and misinforming and we've right. We've tried to share the educational parts. Mm -hmm. We tried to talk about that. But we, before we go down that path, I'd like to know what was your first realization that you didn't have equal rights? Like, I know we have we yeah. have a generational form here, yeah. right? Yeah. So how did you, I'd be interested to hear, like, I, I understand, you know, you running for office, getting elected, and how did you come to the realization that you didn't have equal rights? Well, I was much older when I w was elected, so, uh, but, I can sort of identify, I came to Arlington 47 years ago, mm -hmm. and um, at that time I was single and wanted to get an apartment and wanted to uh, get a credit card for shopping mm -hmm. and stuff. And um, you had to have the husband sign, sign for you, your, for mm -hmm. you. And, uh, or a parent. And I, w did, I had you know, neither of those handy, and so uh, I was able to m get my own account, but it took a little bit of time and effort and some understanding on the part of the people. I mean, the people. we've come far in some of our laws when that you we think give about that, women the right to own credit. Yes, or to bank their account. own credit. It's yeah. just extraordinary. It is. Mm -hmm. You can buy your own house either, right? Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Ainsley, did you have a defining moment when you started to connect with the Equal Rights Amendment? I don't think it was one defining moment, but it was 
a million little things throughout my life, starting with in second grade when someone would have to like carry something heavy and someone would be like, can we get a big strong boy to help us carry this mm -hmm. box in? And I'd always raise my hand to help and I'd never get chosen. <laughs> <laughs> um, all the way up till now when I'm seeing myself like, I do have certain rights that my peers don't have purely because I'm an upper middle class white kid. Mm -hmm. um, and a really good friend of mine is a um, low income Puerto Rican immigrant. So just like she's uh, one of my good friends and I see a really big disconnect between the rights that we have so with what I have, I'm fighting just as much to get myself equal rights as much as the people who have less than me. You're an ally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Another way, though, uh, that, that you can sort of lay the groundwork for it is uh, in the late 80s and um, into the 90s, the Virginia Education Association mm -hmm. uh, had workshops in the schools for teachers primarily and, and uh, teaching assistants. And it was to work with the, wor the use of language mm -hmm. with kids. You talk about, if I say to you, uh, the mailman did such and such, most children will envision boys or men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you say um, firemen, the same kind of thing will occur. Uh, boys and girls will think of the male gender. Instead of firefighter. Yes. Yeah. And so right. it, it was one of those revelations to mm -hmm. many teachers uh, about, oh my word, I never thought about that before mm -hmm. because they were doing the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But if you say letter carrier or ma mail carrier or firefighter, and mm -hmm. television has done a lot to change their terminology as well, that broadens the spectrum. It also makes people more on a level playing field. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Julia, do you have a defining ERA moment? <laughs> it was probably in college um, when I was taking a computer science class. Okay. and. Um, uh, realized, and this is such a small issue, but I realized that the lab assistant um, would only talk with um, the young men in the class, mm -hmm. and he would not talk with me. I was the only young woman in the class. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned later that he was afraid of women. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was very odd, but I suddenly realized that just because I was a woman, it was hindering my education, yeah. um, which was, was difficult. Can I chime in with um, one sure. point um, relating to uh, one more reason why the ERA would be wonderful is because it also brings about um, greater um, profits for businesses and for mm -hmm. our economy. And I just think that's an important point. Um, Deloitte, mm -hmm. Ernst & Young, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Absolutely. and McKinsey yeah. have all... Apple, AOL, Google, yeah. well, yes. I'm just the techie yeah. in the well, room. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I'm just saying that they've done studies and they yes. found that it improves um, net profits for corporations mm -hmm. and GDP Amazon. for the economy. Yeah. And therefore, that is the reason why all these tech companies have these amazing mm -hmm. gender equality programs, mm -hmm. uh, because they've, they've reviewed these studies. They've really done their climate study and say, look, you know, this, these rising women, you know, who may not have had these opportunities. I'm, I'm in tax, so I'll talk about that after we get your story. But it, it, it just wasn't as diverse. And, he, like, you know, I had a very similar situation where I was just kind of, you know, looked over mm -hmm. because simply because of my anatomy and gender. But I agree. We are a thriving economy when all have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the reasons, actually, HQ2 has decided to move here. Mm -hmm. right. So, would it, so talk about your ERA moment and then maybe you can weave that into the yeah. HQ2. Sure, thank you. Um, so for me it was relatively recent because I was born and raised in a state, um, California, that ratified when I was a baby, yes. right? California. <laughs> <laughs> so um, living here now for my second step here, living here, working on uh, 13 years, um, I was invited as um, a Fairfax County Commissioner on the Commission for Women. I was invited to a National o Association of Commissioners um, meeting, conference, in Los Angeles, of all, of all places. And I was sitting with the Nevada delegation and the Illinois delegation, and Camilla Lopez was up on the podium, and she was talking about how we don't have equal rights yet. And I thought mm -hmm. to myself, looks around, and I thought, okay. And she said, yes, 13 states haven't ratified. Mm -hmm. I thought to myself, how ignorant am I, first of all? You're being right? pumped, right? <laughs> right? I, I thought that, and I thought, which darn states are those? <laughs> and when I heard Virginia, I wanted the table to open up and swallow me in, wow. right? So <laughs> I, I came immediately running back and said, okay, what can I do and how can I make it happen? Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it really resonated and stunned me all at once. 
So I got educated fast. <laughs> I must say she is educated very fast and you have been along with many others on that playing field with uh, the VA Ratify ERA yeah. movement, which has just picked this grassroots movement mm -hmm. up and revived it and brought it to the forefront. Because from the beginning, we just yeah. talked about Virginia being the 38th state. Could you imagine? Making I mean, history. we made yeah. history in 2017, electing and starting this mm -hmm. wave of and women. And this Congress And now. this Congress yeah. and this voice that said women are now taking the bull by the horns and saying no more. That's right. right. Putting We've, our foot down. And putting our foot mm -hmm. down. And it's a beautiful thing, yeah. right? Um, when I experienced the, the, the understanding of inequity, I was so angry. Mm -hmm. I, I said, you know, I knew what it was like to feel like a person of color and to be treated that much differently right. just, just by race mm -hmm. alone. And then I knew that because I was a girl that I wasn't expected to do certain jobs or be into certain fields. And I've always was challenging the status quo. Mm -hmm. So I think that encapsulated my experience and I started advocating for women. Right. So for 10 years, I was like equal work for equal pay. This impacts everything from our livelihood, our, our, our health care to everything Families. we were talking about. And um, I think another important point about that, Hala, is um, the uh, by having a federal equal mm -hmm. rights amendment, I, it's exemplary in that we say it impacts only the federal government, but the truth is, is that what happens at the federal government level gets modeled by other businesses Absolutely, and changes yeah. culture yeah. incrementally. Mm -hmm. And so we may not be impacted, but you will be, and yes. your daughters mm -hmm. and your yes. granddaughters, right? And so I feel like we have to this fight for so that. This is so great. We have all of this, <laughs> this, this zhuzh going on. <laughs> I couldn't find the word. Let me ask you ladies a question, if I may. We are in session. Jennifer is standing up mm -hmm. talking about the Equal Rights Amendment. I'm going to bring you fast forward to the future, and we're arguing this on the floor. I know I can, I'm going to barely keep it together, so I'm going to look for your faces up there in the galley, uh, gallery, and it passes. It passes. The button goes green. Men finally stood up and said, yes, we're with you. What are you going to do, Julia? <laughs> Celebrate. I'm going to turn to hug you. Yeah. <laughs> then I'm going to jump and hug you. Yeah. Yes, it would be fantastic. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Can you I mean, can't you just that? feel that? Yeah. Yes. The it, energy, the excitement. Yeah. Yes. Just, the green button. We mm -hmm. have enough votes to, to put women in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. How does that feel to you? It, it sounds almost possible now which I think mm -hmm. I, I you know I really have that belief that now mm -hmm. and what I think is interesting is uh, today I know that uh, we uh, were uh, sort of primed on the Human Rights Day mm -hmm. and that uh, it's kind of nice to know that the whole world mm -hmm. thanks to the United Nations when it was it was done the year that it started in 1948 mm -hmm. so today we have the 70th anniversary and that says equal rights for men and women internationally. And it's the community of the, na of the world that has to be the monitor mm -hmm. on that kind of thing. Absolutely. And we want to be able to be in the same category as the world. Absolutely. What do you think, Ainsley? What will you do? I'm almost crying just thinking about it. I'm going to be so happy when mm -hmm. this happens. And I firmly believe that it will happen in this upcoming sense. Uh, part of a speech that Jill Ruckelshaus gave to the California Convention of the National Women's Political Caucus in 1977, when this was all being discussed. We are in for a very, very long haul. I am asking for everything you have to give. We will never give up. You will lose your youth, your sleep, your patience, your sense of humor, and occasionally the understanding and support of people that you love very much. In return, I have nothing to offer you but your pride in being a woman and all your dreams you've ever had for your daughters and nieces and granddaughters, your future, and the certain knowledge that at the end of your days, you will be able to look back and say that once in your life, you gave everything for justice. That's right. And I think Amen. that says it all. Yes.
I have to wait for it. I think so. I think out when you see the last. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll be on it. Yeah. But there will be a party. There will be a party. <laughs>